Six months ago, in the lead up to the last October's federal election, the attempt by some campaigns to appeal to racist, to racist sentiments as a strategy to win votes was a low moment for Canadian politics. This, moment, this morning, our guest speaker, Jeet Heer, and our response panelists will reflect on issues of race and identity in Canada's social and political landscape, landscape and will discuss the future of pluralism in Canada and Quebec. That's better. So right now, it is my pleasure to introduce Canadian writer Jeet Heer. Jeet is a senior editor at the New Republic who has published in a wide array of journals, including the New Yorker and the Paris Review. Jeet is also the author of Sweet Lechery, Essays, Profiles, and Reviews. He is also a master Twitter essayist. I just asked him what that was. And a member of the journey panel for the 2016 Scotiabank Giller Prize. Please welcome Jeet Heer. Okay. Uh, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, so the topic is um, xenophobia and the future of Canadian pluralism. And um, I think we don't have to say too much about the fact that we're living in a xenophobic moment, uh, in not just in Canada, but I think uh, throughout the Western world and arguably globally. I think there's perhaps even just one word I have to say, which is Donald Trump. Uh, but, but I mean, beyond Trump, uh, more specifically to us in Canada, uh, I think last um, year during the federal election, uh, the federal conservative party ran uh, a disgracefully xenophobic campaign that specifically targeted uh, Muslim Canadians and uh, tried to marginalize them and scapegoat them uh, through um, raising the issue of the niqab and the Barbaric Cultural Practices Act. Uh, so. The, but, but beyond that, I mean, um, uh, as many in, in this conference know, there's like issues in Europe, and I, I think that these um, issues are of particular concern, or should be particular concern, for those of us who are uh, politically progressive, and especially for social democrats, because I think that this is a real fissure and problem uh, that social democratic parties, especially in Europe, are facing, but I think uh, also here. So that's the sort of broader um, context, that there is a kind of uh, a general rise of xenophobic politics. Now, there's two kind of broad explanations that are given for this. Um, one is that, well, we have terrorism, and that promotes xenophobia. And the other is a more economic argument that, uh, you know, uh, growing, we're living through um, uh, the Great uh, Recession, uh, still in an age of austerity, uh, and uh, that this is a sort of natural rise of scapegoating uh, during um, uh, a period of economic uh, turmoil. And I think both these explanations actually are limited and I want to um, perhaps step back a little bit and like uh, try to look at like what are the roots of the xenophobia and and move away from these like uh, for the terrorism explanation which I think a lot of people use just instinctively they say well you know there was um, uh, the attacks in Paris and now in Brussels and xenophobia is on the rise um, the actual history sort of belies us and there's a very um, Curious fact, uh, which is um, uh, brought up in a book by uh, Christopher Bale called Terrified, how fringe um, uh, uh, Islamophobic groups took over the mainstream. Uh, it's a book from Princeton University Press, and he like um, uh, surveys the sort of history of Islamophobia. And one thing that he uh, brought up, which I think we really have to think about, is that during the period after 9-11, there was a steep decline in Islamophobia, at least as measured by public opinion polls. That is to say, after 9-11, you know, this uh, terrible terrorist attack, um, uh, uh, which led to, like, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of discussions of a clash of civilization and to um, uh, yeah, military intervention in the Middle East, um, the, if you polled American public opinions, um, they were more inclined to, uh, most Americans were more inclined to say they have a favorable view of Islam after 9-11 than before. And that might seem like a little bit um, uh, odd. And the, uh, but it's, it really shows the importance of um, elite leadership in framing these issues. Uh, because immediately after 9-11, uh, uh, President Bush in the United States uh, made a point 
of um, saying that, you know, Islam is a religion of peace uh, and uh, that America has uh, Islamic uh, uh, allies in the Muslim world that uh, it, it's working with. Um, and that really had uh, an effect in shaping public opinion. And in, when he was doing that, there was a parallel move within Canada itself. In 2003, Stephen Harper wrote a memo internal to the Conservative Party saying that one of the top priorities that the Conservative Party has to have is to um, uh, expunge racism and xenophobia from the political party. Uh, so, so there was a moment after 9-11, going to 2000 to 2003, when um, there was uh, elite conservative uh, political leadership that tried to stay away from Islamophobia, and not only tried to stay away from it, but actually stigmatized Islam Islamophobia and in the public uh, sphere. And that had a real influence on public opinion. Um, But if we look at, um, again, using Bale's book, um, where um, th then did this Islamophobia come from if it wasn't like an immediate response of terrorism? And one interesting thing that he shows is that it really starts to rise in 2008, um, and he links it to uh, the Republican uh, Party, uh, there being people in the Republican Party that wanted to make an issue of President Obama uh, being, you know, not just the first um, um, African-American president, uh, but also having an exotic background, uh, the, uh, a Muslim father. And, and this was really the sort of the birth of, uh, the sort of birther uh, movement and uh, the, the use of um, xenophobia for political grounds. So uh, ironically, when you had a Republican, it was, um, there was a, an incentive structure for the Republican Party to uh, oppose xenophobia and uh, that, um, uh, broke down once Obama uh, became uh, the first the presidential nominee and then the um, the president. Uh, but I, it, beyond that sort of um, uh, partisan aspect, there was also uh, tensions within the conservative conservative, conservative movement in uh, both the United States and I think we see something parallel in Canada, uh, which is that you had um, two different uh, approaches to um, uh, dealing um, with changing demographics. You had, on the one hand, people who uh, were saying that um, the conservative parties need to have outreach to minority groups to bring more of them in. Um, and this was a very much a sort of position of political elites uh, like uh, George W. Bush, uh, Harper initially, uh, Karl Rove, and, but then there was like, within the conservative movement, um, there were people who uh, resisted that and who saw, um, uh, uh, who wanted to challenge these elites and who then took up issues of immigration and xenophobia um, as a way of recasting conservatism. And that tension, I think, is very um, interestingly played out in the sort of Conservative Party of Canada because on the one hand, um, the Canadian Conservative Party has um, uh, initially uh, from like 2006 uh, until like uh, last year, it sort of prided itself on the fact that it was a more open and inclusive Conservative Party. You know, like this is just a famous Jason Kenney uh, going around to uh, uh, Sikh temples and to Hindu temples and uh, making um, uh, outreach. And there is like evidence that that was successful, that within, um, that the Canadian Conservative Party were much more successful than conservative parties usually are in uh, reaching out. Um, but what, uh, and in the United States, um, people who wanted, people within the Republican Party who wanted it to be more inclusive cited the Canadian Conservative Party as a model. So it's worth asking um, why that model like sort of broke down and why uh, uh, Stephen Harper and Jason Kenney took a kind of like a real swerve towards a much more explicitly xenophobic politics. And I think that the um, uh, general explanation uh, is that uh, during a period of electoral difficulty, uh, they needed to revive the base. And what they found was that the sort of disaffected base were exactly uh, the people I was talking about, the people who um, uh, 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 were from the, the sort of grassroots activists 
who felt that the party had betrayed him through this effort of outreach. Um, and uh, it, it, this is unfortunately something that's not very well written about by journalists, but I think a, sh a shorthand for this is a sort of movement called the alt-right. Uh, which, uh, if you have a very strong, strong stomach, you can sort of Google. But these are sort of very young, uh, white, um, uh, uh, largely men who are very active on the internet, on Twitter, who are like very much more vocally racist than has been the norm. Um, and there has been a real, um, uh, this group has actually been really um, uh, becoming politicized and very active. And the Donald Trump has very successfully recruited many members of the alt-right, and he often sort of like nudges and winks at him through his Twitter account. Like he's often retweeted neo-Nazis, and the people he's retweeting are these people on the alt-right. And this is, I, I very strongly believe, a deliberate strategy on his part. Um, and. Uh, this ha hasn't been written about well in Canada, but there's reason to think that this happened um, uh, here as well. I, uh, before the last election started, a member of the Conservative Party had contacted me uh, expressing anxiety about the fact that the Conservative Party was recruiting many people from what he considered to be the fringe, you know, almost neo-Nazi right, and was going through uh, things like 4chan, which is a sort of um, very racist sort of message board, and trying to recruit people from there. And I, was, I tried to like do a story about this, but this person was um, unwilling to come forward with like the sort of the documentary evidence for fear of losing his or her job, uh, but, uh, but but I think that um, I have very every reason to think that this person was telling me the truth because what uh, the, what um, uh, he or she said actually came about that the uh, he or she before the election started like basically told me that this is the pathway the conservatives are going to do to to rev up support among the alt right and among this sort of new generation of uh, uh, activists in the face of sort of the party in decline, uh, they will go that way. So I think that, that that speaks to some of the sort of political dynamics that are at work. Um, but I think furthermore, um, in this particular case, in, in the Canadian context, uh, Jason Kenney and Stephen Harper thought that they could get away with Islamophobia through a policy of divide and conquer. They thought that if they just go after Muslims, they could still keep the support of uh, Sikhs and uh, uh, Hindus and other immigrant groups. And um, uh, I myself am a sort of Sikh Canadian, and I can just, this is anecdotal, but um, I, uh, that did not work. And uh, uh, in large part, a lot of what I heard among sort of immigrant groups was that their fear that, well, if they're going after the Cobb, what's to stop them from going after the turban next? And there's a way in which this sort of, you know, general rise of Islamophobia is creating a new sense of sort of solidarity among racialized peoples. Um, uh, because racists are not very intelligent, a lot of the people who get attacked uh, by, uh, um, uh, it, 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 during this rise of uh, Islamophobia are turbans Sikhs, and there's been a lot of sort of hate crimes against sort of Sikh men uh, and women who wear turbans. Uh, and there's been a sort of a, a, um, interesting sort of tension within the Sikh community where initially there was a sort of response of trying to say, we are not Muslims. So the, we have to respond to these attacks by, you know, pointing at people that we, uh, we're not Muslims. And But if you actually look at like the sort of activism that's going on around young Sikhs, um, now the, 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 that sort of changed the idea that, well, we are Muslims. Like, like we're not literally Muslims, but if people think we're Muslims, and if the rise of Islamophobia is going to lead to us being victimized, then we have to have solidarity. Uh, and, and I think that's a very real thing. And I think we see that in the very poor showing that the Conservative Party had uh, in uh, sort of immigrant writings that they had won in uh, 2011. So I think that's a more sort of hopeful note. Um, and I just want to end. Um, with uh, just a few sort of brief points. So the, the, the loss of the Conservative Party was, I think, a very good thing for many, many reasons, uh, but, but not least of which is that this sort of uh, politics failed. I, I worry that the, um, uh, even though the sort of conservative xenophobia failed, the response of both sort of um, the liberals and social democrats is inadequate. The, the, the liberal response is a kind of sort of tokenism, which we see in Justin Trudeau's cabinet, which is, it's okay, but I mean, you know, like if one knows about sort of real politics, um, uh, it's still the case that sort of like women get like sort of like lesser positions within the cabinet, and also that more, more broadly um, uh, power in Canada has not uh, become any more diverse, uh, much more diverse than it was before. And so there's a kind of like tokenism politics of liberals, which I think is very inadequate. And I think, 
there's a social, social Democrats, I think, have this sort of similar issues, which I think I sort of playing out a little bit in Bernie Sanders' campaign, which I otherwise very much admire. But I think a lot of times Sanders stumbles on the fact that he has this old sort of uh, class first politics or emphasis on economics, which makes it very difficult for him to ad address issues of racism in and of itself as something bad. And that, I think that's a real sort of uh, 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 problem. And I, I think that the sort of, uh, the other problem is sort of Canadian self-congratulate uh, self-congratulation because <laughs> there's like you know like Justin Trudeau really has tried to make this a big selling point that you know like uh, and 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 then a lot of the stuff I very much admire as politics to greet the Syrian refugees uh, at Pearson and to, to um, uh, so th that's all very much admirable but I think that sort of self-congratulations tends to lead to an idea that we don't have racism here that the racism is something that's over and that's a real problem and I think that the Canadians are often very deluded as to the extent the uh, uh, of which uh, there's alienation among immigrant group groups. And I see this as a Trontonian because who lives in North Etobicoke in uh, the writing of the late Rob Ford. And I can tell you that, you know, one reason why this very strange, you know, mafioso figure uh, <laughs> was able to rise is that a lot of like his community, which is like working class immigrants, were willing to overlook his own racism because they felt that his um, boss politics, his, his uh, uh, padroni politics gave them something and they were otherwise alienated from uh, the actual uh, from uh, liberal and social democratic politics and I think that the the, the fact that Rob Ford was elected mayor of Toronto should be a real wake-up call uh, for to the, to the extent of alienation that exists um, and I want to end on uh, to, we'll have uh, other uh, speakers come in, um, uh, but I want to end on two th uh, things uh, that we can perhaps take up in the rest of the discussion, which is that I've been talking about Canada at large, but they're sort of Quebec-specific issues, and I think that they come very much out of the fact that Quebec is a sort of uh, a predominantly Catholic society where the Catholic Church is very powerful and then it's secularized. And there's a way in which Quebec secularism um, uh, runs into tension with immigrant communities. Uh, and I think is very similar in some ways to the way uh, uh, secularism in Europe does. And I think that's something that especially people on the progressive left need to think about. Um, and the other issue is uh, dealing with uh, uh, sort of gender. And I think that there's ways in which um, uh, a, a part of the appeal that the conservative parties are trying to make is that well we're actually being gender inclusive you know things like the niqab are very uh, oppressive and uh, I mean that's a conversation very much worth having but I think that what often gets missed and which I want to maybe take up in the rest of the discussion is that um, uh, uh, women from these um, uh, uh, groups that are racialized or made um, xeno uh, made uh, alien are then become the victim of this politics the most uh, just this morning I was looking at the news and there's a, a woman who's wearing a hijab in uh, uh, Manhattan who was who had her face slashed by somebody who was yelling that she's a terrorist and I think a lot of the hate crimes that go against Muslims in particular do seem to target women and that's uh, and there's other ways in which this sort of is, uh, xenophobic politics uh, uh, um, uh, has a sort of fractal effect it marginalizes those who are already the most marginal and I think that's something worth thinking about yeah Hi, I'm Francine Pelletier. I'm a journalist and documentary producer. I was here last year to film a session of the uh, Progress Summit, and I'm delighted to be back. It's never boring at the uh, Broadbent Institute, and I do not think that this session will be boring either. And before introducing our two discussants who will be reacting to what Jit, uh, who would be reacting to what Jit just told us. I just wanted to uh, give you my two cents worth and say that I'm really delighted to be here because of the uh, Broadband Institute's work. And I think that I'm speaking for uh, countless people in Quebec as well as in Canada who were terribly shocked during the last uh, uh, election with the uh, NICAP divisive tactics and also in Quebec we 
experience something even more intense because it, it was an even lengthier debate on the uh, Charter of Values in Quebec, right? So I would like to seize this moment to say that Gloria Steinem said something extraordinary this morning when she said, we are linked, we're not ranked. And that it was impossible, and in fact that it had never been possible to be a feminist without also being uh, anti-racist. But you must admit that sometimes we forget that. Don't. Therefore, without any further ado, because we're going to have a discussion, let me introduce our two discussions. Firstly, Ms. Monia Mazik, who is the author, who is a published uh, author and a human rights uh, activist and who is also the national co coordinator of the co coalition for the uh, for the, the international civil rights. You probably know Ms. Mazik, thanks to her epic battle to free her husband, who is Maher Ara, who endured years of uh, uh, torture. And by the way, Ms. Mazik wrote a book on that, entitled Imprisoned Tears. And uh, to my immediate left, we have Mr. Anu uh, Bouazi, who is the co-founder and the co-chair of the Association of um, Mo uh, Muslims and uh, Arabs for Secularism in Quebec. He's been uh, campaigning for human rights for 15 years, firstly at uh, Amnesty International. After that, he fought bravely against the uh, Tunisian uh, dictatorship. So Arun is Tunisian. His fight for uh, freedom w won him the, uh, the honor of the uh, Commission for Rights and Democracy in Quebec last December. So it's not an everyday occurrence for us. Firstly, logistically, Arun and Monia will be speaking in French. So I'll be switching between French and English. So please make sure that you have receivers, interpretation receivers. If you need interpretation, I wanted to say that it's a very rare occasion for us to bring Canada and Quebec together on something that is as sensitive as the topic of xenophobia. So this is that's our challenge this morning. Arun will speak first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting us, for inviting me. Obviously, we have about six minutes to debate a topic that has been ongoing in society for centuries. So this is not going to be simple. Having said that, though, let me start by saying that the word xenophobia is not my preferred term, just already to uh, upset everybody, <laughs> including the organizers. I think that we should really talk about racism, because xenophobia really uh, relates to the fact that we don't know somebody we hate, somebody we hate out of ignorance, whereas virtually 100% of racists start by saying, well, I have an, a, a, an Arab or black uh, friend, so this person is not totally unknown. There has been a build-up. I will be talking about Islamophobia, amongst other things, because it is a word that has been overused today, and sometimes we almost have to, don't have the right to use it. And there have been a lot of myths associated with that word so that we shouldn't use it. And the word racism, by the way, is often also uh, uh, tortured or troubled and we don't dare use it. And we see the word feminism. We even have a minister of uh, women's affairs in Quebec who said she's not a feminist. So at the end of the day, all the words that are meant to uh, uh, claim uh, freedom or equality and justice uh, get attacked and uh, end up with a controversial definition. So I, I define Islamophobia for myself as being first and foremost acts of hatred, of rejection and discrimination against somebody because of their real or presumed bel uh, membership of the uh, Muslim religion of Islam, and that applies, of course, to homophobia, actions that are taken against somebody uh, to reject that person because of their sexual orientation. We've talked a lot. We talked a lot about Islamophobia during the last election. It's a form of racism. And one of the things that we often hear, and I'll probably start talking about this, and uh, 
I will be my own uh, devil's advocate. And one of the things we often hear people say is that Islam is not a race. So Islamophobia is not racism. Well, I have a scoop for the racist. Blacks are not a race either. But there is racism still against blacks. So the idea, obviously, is that there are no races, but there, are, uh, ra th but there is racism. And there are racists. And there are people who are victims of racism. Racism is not only acts. It's one of the big differences, I think, between the left and the right. In terms of understanding those concepts, we might agree on the actions, but the fact that you step back to try to understand how you got to uh, doing those things, well, you lose a lot of people along the way. For instance, in Canada, we realize that there is a huge racism problem towards uh, First Nations and uh, Aboriginal people. One of the differences between uh, the Conservatives and the Liberal Party is that the Conservatives said, yes, each case is important. That's why we always investigate each case of violence, because it matters. But the question is, how come uh, when we step back and we realize that an Aboriginal woman is four times more likely or ten times more likely to commit suicide, to be uh, assaulted by their uh, spouse or their husband, and to disappear? deconstructing the system, that's where the real fight against racism will start. And so long as you talk about acts alone, you're just dealing with the consequences of the system and, uh, and not the racial domination system per se. So this system, how does it work? It works quite simply. It works the same way for us with all the systems of domination. You take a group, right, and you give it a culture, and you make that an essential feature of that culture, in that they have a specific culture, for instance. A black, well, the black will be violent, and uh, they, they have natural rhythm, and uh, black women are hysterical, and, uh, and women in general are sentimental, hysterical, and Muslims, they are all that. They're violent and all the other uh, evils. And uh, the, uh, if, uh, the uh, uh, Muslim women are s submissive. So that culture, by definition, is inferior to our culture, the majority culture, and is therefore dangerous. And what is really important, and politicians have played a, a big role, unfortunately, in creating this system of domination, is you have to understand how people, uh, this uh, di cultural difference is created in people's minds. And uh, in the end, we see people only through their religion, and by definition, it makes them inferior as a second-class citizen. I'll conclude on that because there is a lot to talk about. But as you said so well, politicians have a responsibility because in a way they do define public morality. They do define what's moral, what can be said and what can't be said and what you should do or not do. In Quebec, if you have a government that says that it's okay to forbid Monia from working in the public service and that she'll be fired from, the, from her job, not because she doesn't, she's not fluent in French or she doesn't have the right credentials or because she's incompetent. No, she'll be fired just because she's put a scarf on her head. The consequence of that action is that she is perceived as a danger and directly you find yourself with a, a, a spike in uh, Islamophobic uh, acts and that's where we come, to get, uh, we come together because sexism and racism do actually meet. And uh, it's women who are often assaulted uh, on the streets. You just talked about the example from New York a while ago. And in Quebec, and not just in Quebec, by the way, we also saw similar cases in Ontario where it's women who wear the scarves that are the most uh, assaulted. So what matters is that we have to realize that all those systems are built up the same way. So we won't win one battle at a time. We have to win all the battles together, and uh, we won't just succeed. We won't succeed just by fighting anti-Semitism or homophobia or sexism. We have to make sure that we understand how these uh, systems of social domination are constructed, and then when you add to that the issues of uh, exclusion and classism, because there are also problems related to access to a dignified uh, life. Together, we have to fight all that together and be careful ourselves not to take part in those systems of domination. Thank you.
merci, Haroun. Uh, merci. Thank you, Haroun. Uh, thank you, Francine. Uh, thank you, uh, Gilles. And uh, thank you to the Broadband Institute for having given us uh, this opportunity this morning uh, to come and speak to you and uh, discuss uh, this very important topic, uh, uh, a very current issue that concerns us all. So I've given, been given six minutes uh, to uh, speak, uh, uh, as uh, Tarun has said, uh, to uh, deal with a very vast subject. So I'm going to uh, use my notes to make sure that I uh, optimize the time that I have. In 2007, the debate uh, that occurred on reasonable accommodations polarized uh, Quebec society. The requests from certain religious groups uh, were amplified, exaggerated by the media, and, and also used by political parties to enter into a very dangerous spiral where the presence of religion, other than the Catholic religion, uh, became a source of unease, a general unease in the community. Things are quietened down for a few years, but the debate then resurfaced in 2013 when the Parti Québécois in Quebec uh, based its entire political campaign on the interdiction of certain uh, religious symbols in public places. But nobody was uh, uh, thrown by it because uh, the Charter of Rights uh, that was supposed to promote uh, uh, civilian society in Quebec became the ideal pretext to, int to forbid Muslim women from uh, wearing a niqab or the hijab in the workplace. If the rest of Canada didn't feel that it was necessarily concerned by the events in Quebec, uh, by, in fact, uh, appearing uh, to be above all of those issues or by invoking the, the theme of the two solitudes. In February last year, it wasn't the same during the federal campaign. The uh, former prime minister, Stephen Harper, as my uh, uh, colleague uh, Jeet here uh, demonstrated, uh, tried to play the very dangerous game of uh, fanning the flames of uh, xenophobia, discrimination, and xenophobia. And uh, he introduced uh, a law or a bill on zero tolerance uh, for barbarian uh, practices. So uh, there was a, a clause. Uh, he forbade, in fact, uh, uh, women who wear the niqab to be uh, sworn in as Canadian citizens. Uh, he uh, used uh, the decisions made by various Canadian jurisdictions in uh, favor of Omar Kader, for example. Uh, so he even went as far, and uh, this is really uh, where the sublime, uh, from the sublime to the ridiculous, he wanted to create a helpline to report uh, barbarian practices, and that was uh, the highlight of his campaign, but I think it was also uh, the summum or the, the uh, high point of racism and discrimination. So he didn't want to he only uh, accepted uh, 1,300 uh, Syrian refugees over a two-year period. So in summary, he was a mini Donald Trump. <laughs> and in the end, he wasn't successful in his uh, attempts. But unfortunately, today, Canada is waking up uh, from a long nightmare that has become reality. For years, Canada surfed uh, on its old reputation, uh, dating back to the Lester B. Pearson days, as a country that participates in peacekeeping missions abroad. Stephen Harper did everything he could since he came to power to prove to the world that Canada is a warring country, a wartime uh, power that can participate in military missions. So we went, we were there in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria as a military presence. Uh, and we were very clearly there to wage war and kill people. And we even took a ferocious uh, position uh, again uh, against uh, Russia during the Ukrainian conflict. So ye for ye once again, we were surfing on the reputation that we had, uh, that we were always open to refugees. And yet, today, 
because of the international context that we have, but also because of the political and economic climate, and also because of all these years of cowardice on the, on the part of certain politicians and uh, bad faith of others, uh, we have a long task of reconstruction to do here in Canada. Uh, we are not Europe, with its uh, very uh, its a tense uh, re tense relationship with uh, Maghreb communities, for example, and its long colonial past. But we have to invest in the education, in public transportation, and employment opportunities for all in Canada at this point. Canada has accepted 2,500 new people from Syria. Uh, 25,000 people from Syria. This has to be seen as uh, wealth, as an asset. But this could become a burden if those people and their children are left to themselves, to their own devices, if the schools aren't equipped with the educational resources that they need, if the uh, professional skills programs aren't adequate to prepare the new wave of refugees into the, for the workplace, if uh, the urban planning of our cities is not creative enough to allow former residents and new residents to mingle, to meet, to talk. If we don't invest in small businesses to encourage the spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship, all of these programs have to be dealt with, uh, all have to be taken into consideration. If we want to avoid uh, xenophobia, that xenophobia and racism and discrimination to become the rule instead of the exception. Because today, the fear of the other is not limited to some unfortunate uh, incidents. It's not just a one uh, mosque that is burnt in Peterborough or a woman who's, uh, who has her, her, uh, her head cover ripped from, from her uh, on the street in Montreal. It's more than that. Islamophobia and racism is an ideology. It's an industry that profits. It's an industry, an industry that profits. It's also political parties that win votes and consumers that consume this ideology and ask for more. So we cannot combat xenophobia, racism, and Islam Islamophobia with educational, with just just by handing out brochures or words of welcome or with selfies uh, taken with refugees uh, who have just uh, gotten off the boat. We have to combat, we have to combat uh, this with educational programs, with adapted social programs, with an, infra, an urban infrastructure that is ad well adapted, but especially with an open vision, a smart, open vision that looks to the future. Thank you. Word to, to tell you that we will be taking uh, questions uh, from the, the audience, uh, but you need to uh, do it on the application. Um, there is going to be an address going up on the screens to tell you where to, to, to get that application, so you'll have to write it through your, your, ta your iPhone or iTablet or whatever device you have. Uh, that will be approximately in, a, in 10, 15 minutes. Uh, what? Then just yell very loud. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think someone is writing me the answer to that question. Pen and paper. Pen and paper. Who, who would have thought? Huh? <laughs> there will be volunteers uh, going around with pen and paper. Uh, it's a throwback to 50 years ago, but we don't mind. Um, so I'd like to, je vais relancer, I would uh, to try and, and put all this a little bit more together. Because, um, Jeet, you mentioned, um, first of all, that Islam, that was a revelation to me, that, that Islamophobia went down after 9-11. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you went on, and that's even a bigger revelation, that the Conservative Party had actually, you know, a camp, a more or less an incentive to want to be inclusive. So how do you explain the ugliness of the niqab thing, the barbaric cultural practices on the one hand, 
And how do you explain that, uh, and the charter of values, if you care to go that, but perhaps um, our, our Harun and Monia will talk about that. And how do you explain that how, uh, the fact that uh, politicians are so quick to go that route, to push the divisive buttons, us against them, and in both cases, they were the people said no. Yes. So uh, I know you. I know. I think it's important to say that as Canadians, we are probably and Quebecois, we are deluded about how nice yeah, we right. are and unracist we are. But at the same time, so how do you make sense of all that? Sure. No, I think those are really good questions. Um, first of all, in, in terms of explaining the turn, I think. My explanation um, is in terms of sort of like electoral demographics, that these, uh, the Conservative Party is um, older and whiter than mm -hmm. Canada at large. And um, they, as I said, the, uh, Jason Kenney and I think Harper thought that they could split the difference, that if they targeted just Muslims, uh, they would lose those votes, but would pick up, they would rev up that, that sort of older white mm -hmm. base. Um, and, and they wouldn't lose other immigrant groups. So I think they, they made a sort of electoral miscalculation. Mm -hmm. But I think more broadly, I think there's a sort of demographic fear among that older white population. Mm -hmm. And I think Donald Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again, kind of speaks to that. Because if you say make America great again, what are you saying, what's the problem with America? And I think for Trump and his followers, the problem is that it's becoming less white. And I think that that's also true of a lot of the conservative party base. And I, I think the point about the Islamophobia being an industry also kind of speaks to this. That there's, um, uh, I mean, I would, I'll name names, like Ezra Levant. There are people who like make um, uh, activist activists who make a sort of money and a political career mm -hmm. out of revving up Islamophobia, and that tends to drive the political dynamic. So that then the uh, uh, political leaders uh, like um, uh, Harper uh, uh, um, need to appeal to that base. So I, I think that that's the sort of dynamic that if you have this older um, uh, uh, this older white group that's afraid that they're losing their country that the, that the world is changing and I, I, I suspect something very similar is happening in Quebec mm -hmm. although I know that less well maybe it's you can it's a little more that. complicated in Quebec yeah. so are you saying to the answer to the question how, why do the uh, politicians revert to these uh, tactics is that there is this there is a a base the old white base you call it yeah uh, who who if you push that button. They will, they will, they will say, they will, they will agree with with the, the divide and conquer rules. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think it's especially the way elect elections are done now is um, we. Uh, political passions are such uh, for the last 10 or 15 years that it's hard to convince people on the other side. So you win elections by revving up the base. Uh, and, and we see this in America. A lot of Donald Trump comes out of these Republican political strategists who had the theory of the missing white voter. They thought that like there's been millions of white voters who didn't come out in the last against o Obama. So you have to like have a more explicitly racist politic to bring them out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, that, that that's a, a wrong analysis, but that's the kind of the basis for this thinking. So, so if you have a politics that's based on appealing to the base and revving up the base, then that encourages this sort of um, uh, uh, more extremist politics. But now in Quebec, it's a bit more complicated. And so I'm going to ask you both uh, to answer this question. Because in Quebec, the Charter of Rights uh, was uh, the product of a, uh, a social democratic party, which was a Parti Québécois, who saw that as uh, uh, a way of promoting uh, equality between the sexes and not going against religion or any particular group. And, but they were convinced that they would win with this. But in fact, a lot of people think that if uh, uh, Calhoun hadn't raised a fist, they would have won. But I'm going to ask you, uh, one after the other, because I was really shocked. I didn't think uh, that the, the, there was going to be a xenophobic reflex uh, uh, that uh, is so uh, deeply entrenched, even if I understand the question of Quebec nationalism. So how do you see the picture in Quebec? Monia, the first. Well, I believe that it's always a pretext uh, today. Uh, we always use uh, the uh, gender equality that as a pretext uh, when we try to uh, defend ourselves, uh, to defend everything that was done in Quebec, uh, because a lot was done, of course, to promote gender equality in Quebec. But 
But the fact is that it attracted, for a time at least, those people, people who believed in, uh, with all their, their soul, uh, in uh, the equality, gender equality. So that was uh, good faith. But uh, it's been said that uh, racists are not uh, necessarily uh, uh, intelligent, and uh, but the population as a whole is not as stupid as politicians like to think. And so what we saw in Quebec is a change, a shift. We weren't looking so much for gender equality, but a group of women who were being promoted. And so what was at first a noble objective that everybody aspired to became uh, a few weeks later uh, a form of ostracization of other women or certain women, uh, a form of discrimination against some women. And once again, uh, and we come back to this point, uh, women who were the most marginalized uh, and uh, the, the women in particular who wear a uh, head cover and uh, who have all kinds of diplomas but have no access to uh, to work at their skill level and so they have to find work in daycare centers and even that work was being contested and i think that i think the people finally understood that it wasn't really a question of equality it was a way of dividing society. It was more than an equality issue. And so that's the shift that became very divisive and uh, really tore the fabric of our society in Quebec. And people said, we don't want to, to be a part of this anymore. And so we're now going to go to the other party. And uh, of course, nobody wanted the Liberal Party, but that's the party that won the election because it was uh, a little above the fray and more open. So it wasn't promoting that kind of divisive uh, value. And so I think we underestimated the reaction. And Mr. Harper made the same mistake, by the way, uh, because he also wanted to portray himself as a feminist from one day to the next, uh, like overnight. And, and at the, one of the first things that Mr. Harper s did here when he became prime minister was uh, to cut back the on the status of woman. In fact, he uh, dismantled the department. And everybody knows that he's not a feminist. And uh, that he certainly can't do it uh, on the backs of women who wear the niqab. Well, I'm going to um, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question, and I agree with Monia because uh, it became very ugly. We started uh, physically assaulting uh, women wearing the niqab, and people said, "Well, no, that's going too far. This is not the kind of society we live in." But before that, the idea, and I come back to Quebec nationalism, uh, what really corrupts uh, the situation or the notion is, for a lot of nationalists, uh, religion is. Uh, and that's uh, is is ostracized and with the quiet revolution of course religion was uh, just completely rejected and so we're a modern society non-racist completely open to the world and so the charter became a kind of a pinnacle a kind of a culmination of that so how do you see it well there's lots to say so let me begin by saying that yes in effect uh, there is a, a sort of a a, f a, a fantasy in Quebec and that that's the uh, quiet revolution uh, occurred because of in the context of a total rejection of religion but in fact if we ask uh, people who were there just before the baby boomers um, it uh, the quiet revolution occurred with uh, leftist Catholics uh, who were actually very fervent so there was no real uh, complete rejection of uh, religion but in fact it was a rejection of the ins religious institutions not the religion per se, per se. and uh, and of course uh, in uh, English Canada there was a difference and that's where the policy had uh, uh, more chances of uh, germinating and and that is uh, in effect to Quebec and that's what uh, Mr. T and it was Mr. Taylor that said it first. Uh, Catholicism has uh, one pe peculiarity. It's a ma uh, it's a major institution that is capable of uh, uh, taking up a lot of space uh, compared to the state. And so civil society was a solution to that. Uh, 
uh, it's a way of protecting the state from the influence of uh, powerful religious institutions. So in the Anglophone world, of course, there were a lot of Protestant churches. And so the fear was much more from uh, government inter intervention in uh, religion than uh, the reverse. And so the fear of religion wasn't so much the fear of religion or beliefs uh, as, as much as a way of looking at uh, so uh, Catholic, uh, the Catholic institutions uh, didn't necessarily respect the freedom of, uh, of speech and ideas, uh, as we know, especially with the Spanish Inquisition and the like. And so even the most libertarian of civil, uh, civilian, uh, civil liberties advocates, uh, in fact, are behaving exactly the same way as uh, the fervent ca Catholics of uh, 50 years ago. So the, there's a lot of contradiction in the dialogue that ensued. But uh, two other issues. Of course, uh, the question of uh, racism comes down to a question of power. Uh, we mustn't forget that. The relationship between the uh, majority and the First Nations, of course, uh, as we can see, are uh, a, a power struggle. Uh, the uh, women's issues is a, a power struggle. And so when we win a war against uh, racism, the, we give minorities more power. And so there's a power that the majority loses. Uh, uh, they uh, have their role uh, in uh, decision making, in uh, financial considerations. And so the, and at the time of crisis, it's very easy to, to jump on that and say, well, as a white majority, we have to protect what we have. And so I'm going to conclude on that. So Quebec, the Quebecers, the Quebecers, how would I say, uh, were had by politicians, I think. They were misled. Because I don't think that in Quebec we're more racist than anywhere else in Canada. Uh, yes, of course, we are a distinct society. But I think in Quebec, in Quebec we do believe in civil society. We do believe uh, that uh, it's not up to religious institutions to uh, define our public policies. Uh, we do believe in equality. So if a politician comes to tell us, well, I'm going to promote uh, uh, civil society and uh, women's equality and uh, with the proper terms, uh, we uh, can really be misled. We, uh, it takes us time to wake up. Uh, so this, uh, this is very complex. And as a result, and thanks to uh, Quebec intellectuals uh, and Mr. Taylor being among them, but a lot of people spoke up and say, no, that's not what we mean by equality. That's not feminism. That's not civil uh, freedom. Uh, STQ did a fantastic job. A FT the FTQ did a, a fantastic job. So uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think that people, uh, it's not because he, uh, he, he uh, focused on the niqab uh, that people rejected Harper. It's because he's been there for 10 years. Uh, and, uh, and people rem remembered that the Parti Québécois was on the list uh, in Quebec, and so they decided to uh, vote for something else because it wasn't, uh, they weren't particularly uh, open to the idea of sovereignty. But uh, it's been shown that uh, Islamof Islamophobic uh, policies uh, uh, don't work. Uh, yeah. Answer quickly. Um, and it, it dovetails with, with a question I have. Uh, the question from the audience is, role, what is the role of community organizing against racism? And I sort of wanted to say, isn't it, isn't it basically that despite the fact that we, we like to think of ourselves as very multicultural Canada, Quebec, we really ignore one another? Like, yes, yes. We really, there's so much ignorance. Yeah, I think that that's like a sort of a crucial point. I think this is a sort of weak spot in sort of Canadian version of multiculturalism, which often takes the form of sort of tokenism or sort of like mm -hmm. politicians. Um, I mean, it, it's the, uh, 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 working through sort of community leaders who aren't really leaders, who are just sort of these sort of fictive heads uh, and not really engaging with community. And I think that uh, the, um, to the extent that there's a solution, it has to, to come from the people themselves, that there has to be sort of more community organization that's really more democratic and not just like um, uh, having somebody who can shake hands with Justin Trudeau. Have you yeah. seen an example of community organizing that you can say, I, I think the, the one that I, I'm most positive about is actually uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, which especially in the States, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's picking up in Canada. And I think that one of the interesting things is that it's not um, a lot of 
community organization that we have is transactional. It's to try to make a deal. And uh, Black Lives Matter um, is very much not trying to do that. And is, which is why, you know, like the mayor of Toronto, who will meet with everybody else, doesn't want to meet with them. Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're actually like trying to put forward an, an agenda that actually involves real change rather than a photo op. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Monia. Um, I think we have a big um, work to, to do, and uh, this, is, uh, is, this is a bit tricky because, um, especially from the progressive point of view, everybody tends to think that their cause is the one, mm -hmm. and this is the best one that we are going to work on. And uh, um, so I think it is a time of, uh, and I think Haroon mentioned it, it's not uh, every, all these issues are linked together. Uh, racism, Islamophobia, um, discrimination, uh, all, all sort of really racism are, um, kind of entrenched somewhere in our lives and it is the moment to work together uh, and by working together we can erase racism um, you know xenophobia islamophobia so i think we need to be more um, doing more partner work um, and I've, I've seen some picture recently of uh, black lives matter in toronto and i was so happy to see not only black there there were um, people, obviously, from Asia, uh, some uh, uh, women wearing headscarf. So I think younger and uh, uh, grassroots organizations, some of them understand this and try it, but it will take more time uh, to, to, to bring results until uh, we can get rid or at least uh, eliminate some, some, some of these obstacles. Um, keeping us apart instead of uh, having us working together for a better society. I won't repeat what has uh, I'll try not to repeat what you've already heard. Yes, we have to eliminate the obstacles and be consistent. If we fight for uh, Islamophobia, we have to realize that it's just a specificity, just as negrophobia and sexism we should always be there to help people who are fighting the other fights because at the end of the day, it's the same thing. Early in the uh, discussion, we did mention that Bernie Sanders had a very class-based approach to racism. And I think that here we should also st uh, start uh, doing a class analysis because we're focusing a lot on racism. And I think we can't solve the problem of racism without putting forward a radical reform. The word radicalism is much used these days, and I think we shouldn't shy away from it. We will all be radicals together for real social change, including when it comes to breaking down in, that is also to break down the violent communitarianism that is uh, being uh, inflicted by the rich white man that is uh, on all the pictures and is the standard that we should all aspire to. That's not what we want. We should want to build a common future. Let's get closer to something that is more constructive at the end of the day. Thank you. So time, it's a, quite an interesting question. Can indige indigenous reconciliation combat old stock, la vieille souche mm -hmm. narrative? Cheat. Um, yeah, I think that the, the, we do need to rethink the story of Canada. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just, the, the, with the question, the one thing I don't like is the word reconciliation, um, because uh, this might be a controversial point, because there's been a lot of sort of truth and reconciliation committees, but I feel like reconciliation, like, implies that the problem is people were impolite, you know, like, we were, you know, we just have to get people together, and then I don't want indigenous reconciliation, I want indigenous justice. Um, <laughs> Uh, but certainly, the, um, the, the, there's a standard narrative of Canada uh, that you know has you know pioneers coming, settling the. And the, the, I'm, I um, uh, teach history, so I know this very well. And that, that there's a standard narrative which really has to be changed. And I, I think that the, to get indigenous rec uh, justice, we do have to have a new narrative of Canada, Absolutely. and that will also challenge other forms of racism. Mm. Yeah. Let's see. Thank you. Monia, yes, I fully agree with that vision because we cannot build this, a new society without looking at what preceded it. And I believe that Canada 
has jumped many pages in its way of reading history. And today, we find ourselves with not just discrimination against uh, Aboriginal women and against Aboriginal people in general, indigenous people, but also many other people uh, who uh, came uh, more recently to Canada and who find themselves in a situation that is more or less similar. I think that the uh, educational institutions have a huge responsibility, and the curriculum as well. We don't teach what happened uh, to Aboriginal people. It's, it's taught rather superficially, and I think we have the responsibility of educating and uh, really getting to the real history or a different version of history than what has been taught so far, just as we need to know what happened to the Japanese who were basically put in camps in Canada, as well as the uh, head tax that was uh, put, uh, that uh, the Chinese who came to Canada had to pay. We need to include that in our history books, just as we need to include what happened to the Jews who were turned back in the ships that were rejected. So I think we need to include all that in uh, the new history of Canada for our youth and our kids in order to ensure that that become our history, not just the history of one dominant group, but rather the history of all the peoples who helped build this country. Thank you. Thank you. Arun, you have the last word. Yes, I really don't have very much to add. I obviously agree with what has just been said. I believe that in general, what we need is to be able to live with our differences, but uh, as equals, we have to uh, get along. And I've been in Canada for 16 years, and one of the things that shocked me today is the, re the, the relationship uh, that uh, the, the fact that uh, Aboriginal people, indigenous people, are treated as uh, a minority and uh, they basically uh, uh, not uh, treated as uh, full citizens. And uh, so long as we don't have equality between citizens, well, the majority will crush the minority because we've had a lengthy uh, history of uh, domination over the Aboriginal people. So we have to overcome that. And uh, we also have to include the history of the uh, Jewish battles, sorry, the uh, Jews who were uh, sent back when they arrived uh, on our shores in ships. We have to recognize our painful historical uh, episodes in order to imagine a really constructive future for ourselves. Thank you. Well, thank you, Arun. Thank you, uh, uh, Monia, and thank you, Jeet. I'm sure somebody is going to come up and talk about continuity. What do we do next?